Hi, and welcome back. In this section, we're going to learn about some common cardiovascular diseases. So let's get started. First, let's talk about atherosclerosis, also known as hardening of the arteries. And what happens here in its most simplistic form is similar to what happens in the inside of, uh, for instance, a pipe from your house. Um, where it eventually gets filled up with more and more stuff until the flow of water through it becomes just a trickle and it backs up into your sink. So here's what happens in real life in our arteries. And for this, like think the aorta and the elastic arteries, the major branches, okay? Some of our muscular arteries. Cholesterol is deposited into the wall of the blood vessel. And this causes an inflammatory reaction because it doesn't belong there. And in addition to the usual things that happen with inflammation, which you'll learn about it in this course, um, smooth muscle is actually going to proliferate on the luminal side, the superficial side of these cholesterol deposits. And so this is going to cause the lumen to narrow just because we've got cholesterol there and we have this inflammatory reaction and now we have this thin layer of smooth muscle forming a cap over it. And this happens again and again and again over time until eventually you get what I'm showing pictures of here. So on the left is a cross section looking at the gross anatomy of a blood vessel. And you can see here is the outer circumference, but the lumen is quite small. And if you look on the right half, you can see this soft, smushy brownish material, a lot of um, dead cells and debris here, which are causing the lumen to decrease so the blood flow into this area is not normal. Now this is about a 70% decrease and so um, there's no surgery that we generally do for this because the risk from the surgery is higher than the risk from non-treatment. Um, taking a similar blood vessel and doing a whole cross-section mount of it. On this one, you clearly can see the tunica media, tunica external is the darker red area. And then now at about six to nine o'clock, you have this big, huge area which has cholesterol that's been calcified in there. And you can see that once again, we have lost about 70% of the lumen. And then the picture on the right is even a higher power. So you can see all these darker purple cholesterol deposits in the wall of the blood vessel triggering this atherosclerotic response. Now what happens is as this continues again and again and again, this lumen can get smaller and then it doesn't take much, some kind of mild trauma, um, which causes the tunica intima to be broken, this cap over this to be broken, which then exposes the subendothelial collagen and that triggers our hemostasis process. Now we haven't torn all the way through the blood vessels, but what's going to, so we're not bleeding outside the blood vessels, but we are triggering platelet plug formation and coagulation cascade. And so you end up with a blood clot sitting there in that 30% lumen or that 50% lumen that was there before, causing even more impedance to blood flow. And this abnormal blood clot formation in a blood vessel due to this abnormal condition of atherosclerosis, this blood clot is what is known as a thrombus. So looking at the appearance of atherosclerosis, I showed it to you on a cross section, but let's look at it if we take the blood vessels and we open them up first. So the first thing that we see is called the fatty streak. And these are just the yellowish areas where we can see that cholesterol have been deposited in the walls of the blood vessels. And we used to say this happened starting around the college age. Now we know in the United States because of our diets, think all those fast food places we take all our kids to so they can get their free toys. We know that these fatty streaks start in childhood now. 
They're very well represented by the time children have reached middle school. And in fact, this has become younger and younger where now we're starting to see them at about the time children enter kindergarten and first grade. So this is not progress. Okay. After this, as we continue our deposits and our inflammatory reactions and we have narrowing, we can start seeing bulging into the lumen on more than one side. If we open up the aorta entirely, this is what's called complicated atherosclerosis. As you can see, there's nothing smooth about the lumen, about the surface of this artery. Nothing smooth at all because we have all these complicated plaques of atherosclerosis, any of which could result in a local thrombus. Um, narrowing it slightly as we can actually, you can clearly see one right there. Um, well, I can clearly see it, just take my word. That's what's, that darker substance is right there. All right, something else that happens and often happens with atherosclerosis because you have to realize we have damaged the wall of the blood vessel, but also can happen from other causes is something known as an aneurysm. So no matter what the cause, an aneurysm is the result of a weakened blood vessel wall, which gives us an outpouching at the site of weakness. So I'm going to give you three different causes and three different kinds of aneurysms. And in reality, these are probably the top three causes, and, and these are the only three types of aneurysm. The first type of aneurysm is called a berry aneurysm. And a berry aneurysm is when it looks like you just have a little round blueberry type structure stuck to the side of a blood vessel. And these are fairly common in the brain, especially around, this is the circle of Willis, and this individual had three of these berry aneurysms. A lot of these are thought to be congenital deformities, and you actually have no symptoms for these at all until they rupture and you have massive bleeding in the brain and a really bad headache, and then you fall unconscious. If you're, and if you're normal, you're probably going to die from it. But there's a very small minority of people who are lucky enough that this bled very little bit and they are actually able to recover. Now, sometimes they are found coincidentally when imaging studies of the brain are being done for something else and this can be picked up. And then obviously um, most of these can be treated before um, if they're picked up incidentally, can be treated before they would cause complications such as a bleed. The second type of aneurysm is called a saccular aneurysm. Um, and the classic example of a saccular aneurysm is what we see in syphilis. Yes, if you have syphilis, that rash will go away, but it doesn't mean the syphilis has gone away. And so in secondary syphilis, you can get the these saccular aneurysms, and they are classical for being in the ascending aorta and the arch of the aorta. So if they leak or bleed, you die pretty quickly. So get your syphilis treated promptly. And the third type of the aneurysm is the classic aneurysm seen in the abdominal aorta due to atherosclerosis. And this is what we call a fusiform aneurysm. The wall has, is so heavily involved with atherosclerosis, it becomes weak, and it's not just one side that projects out like in a saccular aneurysm, because that's where the little spirochete set of housekeeping was just on one part of the blood vessel. Well, here, because atherosclerosis is affecting the entire blood vessel, it, we have this fusiform enlargement. Now, in order to fix this, it is a pretty significant risk. And so surgery does not usually happen until it hits the magical six centimeter diameter. So someplace between five and a half and six centimeters is the sweet spot where the risk from surgery is the same as the risk from having it spontaneously rupture. When it's smaller, they tend not the rupture because the wall is not as weak. And so you just get followed. It's kind of like a balloon popping is less likely when it's this size than when it's this size. 
Now, in addition to rupturing and having a massive bleed, sometimes it's just the wall of the blood vessel itself that can rupture and you will actually see the layers tear away and you can see blood between the layers. Now, ruptured abdominal aneurysms um, are not good. Uh, sometimes they're incidentally picked up on abdominal x-ray because of the calcifications. You can see the outline of the aneurysm. And then sometimes they're picked up on physical exam because when you are palpating the, the abdomen, there should not be any pulsatile masses in there. All right. So now that we've talked about atherosclerosis, um, let's talk about two very serious complications. The most common two things that happen as a result of atherosclerosis. And the first thing I want to talk about is known as the cerebral vascular accident or a CVA. And this is what the layman calls a stroke. Now, 80% of your CVAs are due to ischemia. In other words, you have an area of atherosclerosis in a blood vessel and then the surface ruptures and you get a blood clot that forms at that site, thereby not allowing any blood flow to travel downstream. So all those, all that neural tissue downstream is not getting a blood supply. Now, it's important to know what kind of stroke you have because if it's this these are the ones that you would for instance want to give fibrinolytic um, um, you would want to give agents that will dissolve these clots okay. so here is a picture unfortunately of somebody who had a massive stroke at the bottom is the arch of their aorta and there's a brachycephalic trunk and then on each side you can see the right and left common carotid artery and then the bifurcation you can see the external carotid arteries are pretty good you do see fatty streaks scattered among the external carotid artery and the common carotid artery but over here where this arrow is this is the internal carotid artery and you can see that we've got these big huge plaques obstructing probably about 90 percent of the flow and then right here this reddish thing that happened that is the thrombus that formed and completely obstructed all blood flow into the left internal carotid artery giving a massive stroke on the left side of the brain which killed this individual so if 80 percent of cvas are ischemic that means the other 20 percent must be something else and the something else is they are hemorrhagic so in this case, the weakened blood vessel walls, either due to a berry aneurysm or the aneurysms associated with atherosclerosis, causes weakening of the blood vessel wall and it ruptures, causing a bleed into the brain. As you can imagine in this type of individual, which is one out of five people presenting to the emergency room with a stroke, we don't want to give anything to break down blood clotting and to stop blood clotting because that will make these people have a humongous bleed, making their stroke magnitudes work worse. Sorry. Um, and this can be seen on a CAT scan because this bright white area is showing an area of blood into the brain. So consequences of having a CVA are that the brain tissue is going to start dying in five minutes without blood flow. Because remember, these neurons are metabolically active. They're like some of the most metabolically active cells in your body. And every minute thereafter, you're going to be losing about two million of them. And so if you survive a short period of time we can see that there is some softening and some deformity going on in the brain at the area of the um, stroke this is somebody who survived a little bit longer the swelling associated with the stroke has gone away because you can see the two lateral ventricles are almost back to the same size but at this point i think you can clearly see this wedge shaped area showing the distribution the blood flow going into this area was blocked and so all this brain tissue has died off um, 
This is a CAT scan showing a hypodense area. In other words, showing an area that is not getting blood flow. This is um, a CAT scan done with contrast because you can see the bright white showing where the blood vessels are bringing blood into the brain. And then the slightly wider area that you can see there is perfusion in these parts of the brain, but here in this area, there is no perfusion. Now, if you had this type of stroke and you would live for a while, all of this brain tissue would die off looking like this picture, and then it would eventually be reabsorbed. Those um, scavenger cells in your neural tissue would do their phagocytosis and eventually get rid of all that, and you would end up with a defect in your brain, such as seen in this bottom right picture. I also want to point out that strokes, although they are more common in the elderly because we have had, the elderly have had 50, 60, 70 years of dietary influences, giving them atherosclerosis with high blood pressure and with change of diets, we are seeing strokes in younger and younger individuals. All right. Leaving the brain and moving to the heart, we are going to have angina, which basically is the pain associated with not sufficient amounts of blood flow to the heart, and myocardial infarction, which is the heart attack. And that takes 20 minutes of insufficient blood flow to the cardiomyocytes to occur. So here we have a picture of a cross section of a coronary artery, and you can see this nice, wet black structure, which is a thrombus that has formed. Microscopically here is a slightly older thrombus, occluding a blood vessel. You can see the blood vessel wall. And this is an older thrombus because it has start becoming organized. And at this site of an old thrombus that has ch changed this lumen from probably being only 40% occluded to closer to about 80% occluded. After 20 minutes, muscle cells are dying and you will end up with a scar. So this picture on the top is a heart of somebody who has recently died and is treated with a special chemical. And so every place that is yellow are showing cells that are dead. And as you can see in this one, here is the right ventricle lumen and the left ventricle lumen. This actually is covering um, a significant amount of heart muscle making the heart not able to contract and inject blood as it should. Now, if the myocardial infarction is a smaller area, a scar will form over time as part of the healing process. And here's an example of an old myocardial in somebody else's heart where the darker pink cells are the heart muscle cells and the lighter pink area is just showing the fibrosis, the area where the heart muscle cells were destroyed previously. Okay, now some folks because of heart disease, they have trouble with their conduction system and require a pacemaker. So there are lots of different types of pacemaker. This is just a photograph of one random type. They all sort of work the same way. They all have a power source and have a computer processor. Some are much more complicated. They'll cost $100,000. Others are just simpler and they'll only cost $10,000. Here's the hint. If you're 92 years old, you're not gonna be getting the $100,000 model. Um, because the $100,000 model can do a lot of stuff that the $10,000 model can't do. And so attached to the pacemaker battery pack, we have these flexible wires which have little electrodes at their tip and they are inserted through the subclavian vein, either on the right or the left, then going through the brachiocephalic superior vena cava. And usually one electrode is put in the area of the AV node and the other down at the apex of the heart. Um, then it's turned on and the, it's set as far as how much of an impulse is needed and whether or not, you know, depending on the pacemaker, are we doing a set rate? Are we doing flexible rates? Um, what kinds of things are we doing? And those more expensive ones can also work to give um, uh, electric shock to the heart, for instance, in the case of certain arrhythmias. 
All right. And so then this battery pack is just placed in a subcutaneous tissue, just a little pocket underneath the skin. And you go into your doctor every six months where they do a little check to see how good the batteries are and do you have a good spike from the battery. And when the amplitude of the spike from the battery decreases, then we know the battery's life is decreasing. Um, which depending on the battery can be three years or 10 years. And at that point, you would just have a little skin incision and change the battery pack and not play with anything else. And actually, yeah, that's it. So realizing um, that we do pacemakers for thumb things brings us back to the EKG. And we've talked about normal EKGs and I just wanna show you some abnormal EKGs. So you get some idea of some things that are happening. So we talked previously about how the ST segment was supposed to be at the isoelectric layer. And what happens when you have an acute heart attack, when it's in the process of happening, and usually for about 24 hours, the ST segment becomes elevated. Um, and that has to do with changes in the repolarization happening there in the ventricles. And then Actually, over a few hours, what we will see is not only has the ST segment become elevated, as you can see going across here, but then the T wave actually inverts. And over time, uh, over a few weeks, the T wave will go back to normal. Um, this is a picture of something different, which is known as sorry, these are not in the right order, which is known as atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, what is happening is we are not generating a P wave to travel across both atria. Instead, the atria are kind of like a jello jiggler in that they're just wiggling. And so the heart rate is usually being set by the um, AV node instead of the SA node. And so what happens in this type of thing, when you're exercising, um, you're not going to have the same sympathetic increase in your heart rate. Um, and so these people are classic people that get um, a pacemaker. The next thing I want to show you is ventricular tachycardia, which is when the ventricles themselves are contracting super fast. And so there's no time after repolarization for a P wave to generate the next impulse, we have an aberrant focus in the ventrals causing ventricular tachycardia. The heart rate here is usually around 150 to 180. So as you can imagine, there's very little time for heart filling so that the amount of blood being, leaving the heart with every heartbeat is minimal which means for most people you are unconscious at this time. Yes, there are some young people in their 20s and 30s who can be mentally awake as long as you're just lying flat, but as soon as you would try to stand up, you would pass out. Now, even worse than ventricular tachycardia is something known as ventricular fibrillation. And in this case, what happens is we are not getting any solid contractions. We are just getting the jello jigglers in the ventricle. So here, the cardiac output is pretty close to zero. So some of these arrhythmias we can treat with medications and some of them the medications don't work and we do cardioversions by using external paddles generating voltage starting at a lower voltage and then going up so here's an example of a tracing of somebody getting a cardioversion who was in ventricular tachycardia at the beginning. Then you can see the big spike at the time of the cardioversion and it kind of went into a fibrillation and then another spike was given and then you really were pretty much in a flat line. So here's the thing. VTAC is bad, VFib is worse. There's no guarantee with a cardioversion that you're getting better. And in fact, this top line shows that you went from a VTAC to a VFib to a flat line, which is a bad scenario. As in, if you don't cure that really fast, you have a dead patient on your hand. Okay. Um, and so 
these this bottom one is showing a cardio version given to a different patient for a different reason this is the spike right there and what you see after this one is that this person has st elevations going on so this is somebody who is in the process of having a myocardial infarction at the time all right let me talk about some congenital things that happen um, the first of these is a patent foramen ovale and about 20 percent of the adult population at the time of death if we were to look at your heart we could take a small probe and poke it through um, at the area of your fossa ovalis because normally what happens is not the fossa ovalis is a big hole and it closes like this is basically we have two pieces of tissue and they tend to align over each other and over time they will fuse together but for some people they never fuse together so it's pro patent but physiologically doesn't cause any problems okay some people however do have a patent foramen ovale in that they have a small hole that is there um, and for a lot of these people, it is not physiologically important. However, you can develop little tiny clots there on that irregular surface, which then can travel, break off and travel downstream, which cause problems. If a patient with a patent foramen ovale has pulmonary hypertension or some other lung disease where the pressures in the lung are higher than you would expect, then those type of people could develop a shunt from the right atrium into the left atrium where you're sending deoxygenated blood onto the left side. Um, but this is not common. The next um, congenital malformation is an atrial septal defect, which means that we never had tissue cover that opening properly. And these people have a left to right shunt where oxygenated blood on the left side of the heart, because remember the left side tends to be higher pressure, is going to send blood over into the right side of the heart. So we're going to have oxygenated blood move back onto the right side of the heart, which means the right side of the heart has to work harder, which means it's going to enlarge inside and its muscle is going to thicken. Now, this is not that uncommon. It's about one to two per thousand live live births and um, some of these are minute and will not have any problems and others of these we have ways of dealing with them we can put devices in to um, block that defect to restore normal blood flow so let me just take a minute and show you some of these ways we can do a closure so now probably one of the most common ones is to get an interventional radiologist involved or cardiologists do this as well in the radiology suite where you have a hollow catheter inside of which is the device part of which you are going to be leaving in the patient. And so you start in a vein, usually the femoral vein, and then you travel up the inferior vena cava into the right atrium to where the atrial septal defect is. And so here's the catheter. You have to make sure the tip of the catheter enters the left atrium. Then you start pushing the device out. And if that defect is of a certain size or smaller, then this um, device has a diameter which is bigger than your defect. And so then you can pull back on it to catch it on the left atrial side and it'll be held in place. After which you continue pushing out the rest of the device, which is on the right atrial side, and then you remove the catheter. So here's what it looks like where you have the larger diameter portion on the left atrial side and then the smaller diameter portion, but still large enough to cover the defect on the right atrial side. And then the catheter is removed. And the blue background, here's the entire thing outside of its catheter where you can see that there's a ring of tissue which goes right where the intraatrial septum belonged. And then we have these other two things. Um, and so this is not just a wire mesh cage. It has um, 
substances in it, which really promote the influx, the in growth of um, tissue cells from the heart into this. And so over time, it becomes one with the heart and is covered with tissue. Now, if this defect is too large for one of these expanding devices, then a surgical operation has to be done where you actually take a patch of, and there's a couple of different things you can use to patch, and you cover the defect surgically, which obviously requires a lot of general anesthesia and has a higher risk. Um, and the patient gets put on bypass, whereas the other one, you sedate the patient, but it's all done in the radiology suite. Or, or if you think you're gonna have troubles, they can be done in the operating rooms under radiology fluoroscopy. Um, so that if needed, you can immediately open up the patient's heart to treat a complication. All right. And then similar to an atrial septal defects, we also have ventricular septal defects. And on this one, if you recall, once again, the left side of the heart is higher pressures to generate enough force to send it out the order of the entire body. Then every time the heart contracts, it's sending oxygenated blood back into the right ventricle. And this is a not uncommon and also a somewhat easily treatable congenital malformation. And the last thing I want to talk about is what happens when the ductus arteriosus does not close after birth. Um, and the chances of that happening are higher the younger the gestational age is. So at full term, anything after 38 weeks, this usually happens spontaneously, um, starting within um, you know, a short period of time after birth. Um, and it doesn't cause any physiological problems. If, however, the baby is born at 32 weeks or 28 weeks, your chances of having a patent ductus arteri arteriosus have risen dramatically. So if we look at the normal circulation, um, both the pulmonary arteries with its deoxygenated blood are separate from the aorta with its oxygenated blood. In a patent ductus arteriosus, um, what happens is due to the higher pressure in the aorta, blood typically flows back into the pulm through the patent ductus arteriosus back into the pulmonary circulation. So it is sending already oxygenated blood back into the lungs to pick up more oxygen. So there's more blood flow into the lungs leading to pulmonary hypertension. So there are interventional radiology ways of treating this as well. There's um, using a coil, which can be shot up through a catheter if it's a very small um, patent duct. And, and then you just leave that coil in there and um, you will have microscopic clotting and an influx of um, fibrin and fibrosis occurring in there. If it's a slightly larger patent ductus, there is another device that can be left behind, which is larger, um, that can also cause the same eventual um, process of fibrosis blocking this patent ductus arteriosus. Now, in some cases, neither of these will work, in which case you have to do an operation. Now, this is a very simple little operation. You just find the patent ductus arteriosus and you put what's called a surgical clip, which is this little metal thing on the right made out of surgical steel. It looks kind of like half of a staple. And you just put two of them right next to each other. Why? You always put two in case one of them slips or isn't completely occluded. Then you have a second one right next to each other. And that instantly stops the flow between these two blood vessels. Now, in some cases, we can have deoxygenated blood leave the pulmonary arteries and go into the, uh, into the arch or the thoracic aorta. And one example of that is when we have something called coarctation or this congenital narrowing of the aorta. Um, and what happens then is deoxygenated blood is what is going down into the descending aorta, thoracic aorta. About a third of these cases are associated 
um, with a genetic abnormality where you only have um, one sex chromosome and it's an X chromosome known as Turner syndrome. And so these types of patients, if you had this, you would see the evidence of deoxygenated blood going to the vast majority of the body, whereas oxygenated blood is going um, to the blood vessels further up. Now, obviously this baby didn't have the coarch after the third branch um, coming off the arch because the left upper extremity is ischemic here. So this person's coarch would be between the second and third branches going on there. So that's kind of it. Hopefully this kind of piqued your interest and made you realize why some of these um, things are so important to learn. And um, this is just an example of what board anatomy teachers and um, healthcare professionals do around Easter with their peeps. And so if you don't want to be having open heart surgery at some time in, in your life, think about your diet and change your um, atherosclerotic timetable. Thank you so much. And I will see you again for the next lecture.